great is going on. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. And if you don't have your Bibles, bring it next time. Uh, or read on a gadget, but it will be on the screen, I believe, as well. And I'm going to pray, and then we, will, then we will go in. Lord Jesus, we've sung songs. We've greeted each other. We've prayed. And we've come here to bless you or to seek you or to find you. And Lord, I want to ask this morning as we just look at your words briefly, now Holy Spirit, you would lift our eyes and refresh our gaze as to the miracle of us in this room together today and the wonder of it. And I pray as we come out of this, we would be more caught up with you than ever before. And we would be more envisioned for what you're doing in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm just going to read you one verse. I'd love to spend the whole time talking about the context. I'm going to summarize it, but I hope every time you read something about a verse that uh, you go away and just check out that it is true, but hopefully we'll give you enough context. Ephesians 3 verse 10 says this, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now that's obviously speaking of the church, but it is true and certainly the church is represented by us today. So well, you thought I was just saying some nice things before. This is the Bible telling you that through the church, through its whole life, through the gathered people, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So turn to the person next to you and say, you are God's PR plan. We are God's PR plan. Now don't laugh because they think you're the same as you. You're God's PR plan. He needs a new PR guru, doesn't he? But this is what this verse is saying, is that the church is God's cosmic, in one expression, PR plan. Not that God has a public, needs a public relations plan, you understand, I'm sure. But it's through the church that you and me, through us, that we are displaying this manifold wisdom of God. That's why we say we don't go to church. We are the church. You know, it's a pithy saying, but it's very true. And it's interesting to catch ourselves with our children. We're going to church. Yes, but what do we all think? We're going to a venue or, or a meeting. No, we're going to a people. We're going to a gathered people. But we have been redeemed and we have been gathered to make known, to display, to proclaim, to radiate, to make known the manifold, multifaceted, like a diamond, wisdom of God. Is that how you think of the church? Hallelujah. You are allowed to say no, because for a lot of us, we don't think like that. Most of them, but that is what is going on. So one commentator put it like this. The church of Jesus Christ is the most important institution in the world. The assembly of the redeemed, the company of the saints, the children of God are more significant in world history than any other group, organization, or nation. This commentator is American, so they say the United States of America or insert your nation, compares to the church of Jesus Christ like a speck of dust compares to the sun. The drama of international relations, and there's a lot, compares to the mission of the church like a kindergarten riddle compares to Hamlet or King Lear. And all the events and parades and celebrations and coronations of the world fade into formless gray against the splendor of the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. You can say that a lot today. It means praise the Lord if you're not used to church jargon. So the, another way that the church is described is as the bride of Christ. It's meant to evoke in us feeling and wonder. I mean, even if you don't think a bride is very pretty, you're amazed at it. Although every bride is very pretty, I'm sure. And the worst thing we can do as a people, is if we, let me get this right, not bridegrooms, grooms, grooms, bridesmaids. We're like bridesmaids, aren't we? Fashioning the church of Jesus Christ. We like to present, but we are the bride as well, so it's a bit, but, but the worst thing that can happen at a wedding is when the bridesmaids get in the way of the bride. So when we make it about us, it's like a bridesmaid getting in the way of the bride, because it's about us. 
We are the church, the bride of Christ. And so again, I ask you, when did you last think of the church like that? So when you pour a cup of tea, when you go to your life group, when you open the Bible together, when you just do life together, when you're on a serving team, when you think about the sermon on a Monday or a Tuesday uh, in your workplace or whatever it might be, and you're living out being the church, is this in any sense in your mindset? When you reconcile with someone and relationships get a little bit hard, what is at stake? Is it that you get along nicely? That's part of it. What is at stake at that time? What is at stake is the cosmic declaration of the manifold wisdom of God. Because when you reconcile and when you unite, yes, you're getting along nicely, but you're living out being the bride of Christ. And that particular point is one we'll come back to because I think it's the most important. So just a note on this. What are these rulers and authorities? We read that it is through the church that we're displaying the manifold wisdom of God to rulers and authorities. Well, people are a little bit split on this. Some would say that it's angels. Others would say that it's evil and demonic powers and principalities. I err that way because that's how Paul uses the terminology in Ephesians 6 when he talks about the armor of God. He says we fight against rulers and authorities and spiritual forces of evil. So whether it is angels, it certainly includes the evil spiritual demonic forces. So what it's saying is that through the church, we're declaring to them the manifold wisdom of of God. It's a beautiful declaration. And we're also declaring, are we not to the world, something magnificent about Jesus? Because who gathers on a cold, wet Sunday morning in a school hall in the midst of the mayhem when the world has you so much more to offer? It's people who have been caught by something and who know someone greater and something greater than Jesus. This gathering declares to the watching world, but also to the evil powers and principalities. Now, I've talked about some very nitty-gritty things. Would you agree? Getting together, tea, wiping snot off children in tots, good work team, um, and setting up and just getting yourselves to church. And it can feel like very mundane stuff. And some of you are thinking, Hugh, Surely the stuff that declares the manifold wisdom of God is signs and wonders and miracles. <laughs> Anyone here ever been healed? I have. Anyone ever seen a miracle? Heard of one? God does that stuff and it's magnificent, is it not? It's a beautiful thing. But I don't think that's primarily what Paul's getting at here in these scriptures. You know, we can think that Paul isn't talking about nitty gritty life and relationships. But I mean, miracles display the wonder of God in a certain way, right? But God has Jupiter and the sun and the moon and all these things these fancy satellites are now finding and showing glorious. God has all of that to display one aspect of his manifold wisdom. How is it specifically that the church does it? What is the unique role of the church? Well, as we're going to unpack, I want us to go to Ephesians chapter Two, because what comes before Ephesians chapter three? Ephesians one and two. So Paul is building on something here when he gets to Ephesians three and he says the church displays the manifold wisdom of God. So in Ephesians one and two, Paul unpacks how God saves people who are dead in their sin, dead to God, but in his rich mercy, because of his great love, he makes them alive together with Christ and unites them. And Paul puts it this way in chapter two, verses 11 to 16. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called in circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. This is a good thing to remember when you come to worship. I was, but now I'm not. Hallelujah. Remember that you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope. And without God in the world. But now, hallelujah, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So here Paul's unpacking the wonder of how God saves both Jew and Gentile. And most of us would be Gentiles, those who are outside the Jewish nation. And the Jews at that time were the religious insiders who looked down on what they called were the Gentile dogs. Okay? Non-Jews, these Gentiles, they were outsiders even to the point 
that on the wall of the outer courtyard of the Jerusalem temple, there was an inscription that basically said, your death is your fault if you come any closer. So you have these insiders, and most of us, if not all of us in this room, would have been these, these outsiders. If you cross this line, you will likely die. Stay outside. We have a monopoly on God. They were separated. <laughs> they were alienated. There, there was no hope. Your life was at risk if you dared even try and get in on the, on the mix. They were bitter enemies the whole time. The Jews condescending to the Gentiles. The Gentiles resenting the Jews or the people of God at that time. But then Jesus comes. And this is a beautiful, beautiful chapter because this is true of you no matter when you got saved. Even if you'd say you've been a Christian your whole life, which, you know, at some point you've got to meet Jesus for yourself. Hallelujah, if it was when you were very, very young. But this would be true of us. We were outside of Jesus, but then we have been born, yeah, through these barriers. Jesus taking outsiders and making them insiders. And Paul goes on in verse 14. He says, for he, Jesus himself, is our peace. Can you say peace? Who has made us both one. These, these, these separated, different, would have nothing to do with each other people. God has made us both one and also with him. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man. It's a beautiful way of thinking of the church. One new people, a new humanity in place of the of the two, so making peace. Does our world not need peace between peoples? Whatever the division is, even creed, even color, uh, political party, (laughs) within political parties, the world needs peace. So that he might create himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing hostility. Jesus takes enemies and he makes them one. He breaks down the dividing wall of hostility between man and God and in that between people who would be different. He creates a united people. And that, taking these warring enemies who would have nothing to do with each other, is what I believe Paul is saying when he says it displays the manifold wisdom of God. So the reason I asked you to look around at the start of the service, now you can do it again, is you would have nothing to do with 90% of people in this room were it not for Jesus. Is that not true? Have a look around again. Don't nod too much like I'd have nothing to do with you if it wasn't for Jesus. Keep, keep, that, keep that a little bit subtle. God takes those who are far from each other and far from God. He brings them to himself, and in bringing them to himself, he makes them... One. So we, by being this united body, are displaying the manifold wisdom of God. John Piper puts it like this. He says, I take it then that the wisdom of God is primarily the wisdom it took to devise a plan of redemption as great as this. A plan to unite and glorify Jew and Gentile, contrary to all human expectation, by the horrible death of the mighty Messiah. Therefore, the target for the church is to demonstrate to the evil powers of the cosmos that God has been wise in sending his son to die, that we might have hope and be unified in one body, the church. Therefore, when we fail to live in hope and maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, we send this signal through the galaxies, God's purpose is failing He is not wise. He was foolish. But when we do live in unity, end quote, when we do live in unity, contrary to much of the world, we send this message. God is wise in sending his son and making us one. So what is happening today is a declaration to the cosmic powers that God is wise in sending his son to make us into one new man. And this is a wonderful thing and it's a weighty thing because 
When you lose this vision of the church amongst other stuff, little squabbles end up dominating. They have no place in the church of Jesus Christ because you have been forgiven much. God has been patient with you. God is relentlessly pursuing you and seeking your good. We must therefore locate all of our issues with each other and our personal issues in the bigger picture of Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean that there won't be bumps in the road. Had a bump with anyone in the room? Don't look at them. Lots of bumps. Some of you are married. You've had lots of bumps. Some of you share a house. You've had a lot of bumps. Some of you share a fridge and a flat in a university. You've got, there's a lot of bumps. Some of you just live by yourself and therefore coming into a room full of other people. Just, it's just full of bumps. It's going to happen, but there's a very different perspective in how we carry that. And I just want to speak a few moments in what I think Paul helps us see in chapter 4 about how we work this out in nitty-gritty daily life. So in Ephesians 4, he says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Now I've unpacked, obviously it's not the only calling, but not comrade, but worthy of this calling to display to the cosmos the manifold wisdom of God. How do you walk worthy, O Redeemerites, to which you have been called? With all humility, can you say humility? And gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, or as the NIV puts it, make every effort. Can you say make every effort? To keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So make every effort to keep this unity. So the first thing you've got to notice, it is not a unity you have to attain. So unity is not about doing the same things. Unity is not about looking the same. Unity is given by the Holy Spirit. If you've been born again and the Holy Spirit dwells in, in you, you and I have a unity between each other that goes deeper than any other unity we could ever seek to pursue. And we are not called to make that unity. We are called to keep it. We are called to keep it. It's already given. So an example would be, some of you will know the story, Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius has been praying. God comes to Peter and gives him a vision, tells him not to call what he thinks is unclean, unclean. But actually, if God's made it, it's God's and it's okay. And then Peter goes to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. And he says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for me, a Jew, to associate and visit with anyone of another nation. Just think about that. It's crazy, isn't it? But God has shown me that I shall not call any person common or unclean. And here's the line. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. As a Christian, when we read these things, our answer is, yes, Lord, without objection. We don't have to work out whether we should be doing it. We've got to work out how. But our posture is, yes, Lord, without objection. Because as we talk about unity and reconciliation, there are deep hurts in many of our lives. Are there not? And roots of bitterness have taken hold, or they've taken hold of others and we can't reconcile. That's really hard. Our response to this is simply to say, yes, Lord. I've been bought with a price. Yes, Lord. And this is what makes us unique. And we are to jealously guard it. So the 15 minutes before the service when we have drinks and stuff, it's to create people-on-people connection. It doesn't solve this, but it allows you to look at people in the eye that you've probably been texting all week and where there's been a few, and you just look at each other and you can say, hi, brother, hi, sister. That's why we don't necessarily rush off. I mean, it's okay. If you can't make those things, it's okay. It's an example. We create these points where we can look each other and say, yes, Lord, without objection, I'm going to work at unity here. Make every effort, John Stott says, it's very difficult to express the intensity of these words. Make every effort to maintain unity doesn't mean just avoid trouble. (laughs) It means make every effort. How are you making effort to be united with people? (laughs) The word carries a, a sense of passion in the Greek, a sense of haste. The full effort of man. So making unity does not look like this when you hit a bump with someone. They've got my number. 
We've all done it, haven't we? They can call me if they want. Is that making every effort? Or is it saying you make every effort but not me? And it's not saying, well, they wouldn't listen anyway. That's not making every effort. Now, I, there's a lot of things I'm not saying. There comes a wisdom. The Bible says, as far as you're able, okay, live at peace with one another. Uh, and there comes a wisdom to know when and when not to. But for most of us, I think that line's over there when we think it's here. So my wife and I have this phrase in our home, because sometimes, just sometimes, it gets a little bit fractious. We have this phrase called guard the atmosphere. So we just, when, when I mean, we don't always get it right or be alert to it, but when we know things are getting a bit, uh, we said, hey, we've, we've got to guard the atmosphere. And usually one of us, not the other one, comes up with that. Here are some tips for you. Talk, don't text. Conflict should not be without contact, okay? Texting is terrible for conflict. Just don't do it. It's not in the Bible. <laughs> don't do it. I'm sure I can find something somewhere. <laughs> don't communicate with people. Because when you see someone face to face, you realize the impact of your words on them. So who, whose tone got a bit more edgy during COVID? Most people's. Because you're not face to face. You can complain and turn off the screen. Or you can complain and you can't see the person going like this. And you just think, oh, I can just let you have it. And don't worry about you. Make every effort to maintain unity. We don't have a choice on this matter. And the highest question that should drive us is not what are my rights, but what makes for the glory of God. If you answer that question, all your most fruitful rights will be met. And you have to be eager. So Matthew says this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. If you're making your offering of your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come with your... So this is not even saying if you're the one who's got the issue. But if you know there's this unhealthy fractious division with you, get up, walk across the room, find a communion cup and say, can I pray with you? We need to talk. You can jump and sing and dance and clap and make much of Jesus, but if that's going on and we need to do it, again, a lot of things to be said, how and when best, but if you know it and you're just ignoring it, take action. It also says that we are to do it in humility. This is a sense of, of posture. When we are offended, we think we are entirely the ones who have been wronged often, and someone else is in the wrong. And sometimes that is the case, but most of the time, there's at least a shade of two sides to the story. Often we would say, how dare she, or how dare they? How dare I be overlooked? How dare I be treated like that? Well, Jesus says, love as I have loved you. He was treated badly. He was despised. He was forsaken. He was misunderstood. And yet he took initiative. How do you work out loving yourself? Love your neighbor as you love your? Are you patient with yourself? Some of you aren't and you need to be. But most of us are patient with ourselves. Most of us presume the best of ourselves. I didn't mean that. But we don't give that same grace to other people. We give their standard and we have ours over here. Gentleness, work it out with gentleness. Moses was called the meekest man alive. But when he came down from the mountain and there were golden calves, didn't mean that he didn't deal with the issues, but there was a meekness to him. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Patience, <laughs> can you say patience? It's just long-suffering being willing to do the hard yards and wait and trust God. So those are just some practical things just from these few verses in Ephesians chapter four about how we can work out this thing. And so you've had in this preach too, got this big picture of what God wants us to do, to just manifold wisdom of God displayed, but it comes down to, in many cases, 
very nitty-gritty outworking. And you cannot do any of that unless your heart has been captured first by, by Jesus. You cannot love as he's loved you if you're not understanding how he has loved you. So as there is a horizontal deficit, I always say this, if you think, I want to work this out, but I can't, I can't, you need to take a step back and chapter two, remember that you were dead in your sin, an outsider who's been brought near by Jesus. That's why some people get really excited when we come to sing together, because they are remembering and then they are rejoicing from where they have come from. So brothers and sisters, I implore you for the sake of God's name in the heavenly realms, Make every effort to maintain unity. You working out unity amidst diversity, amidst pain, amidst betrayal and hurt, amidst misunderstanding, declares to a watching world and watching heavens the wonder of God's wisdom. And if you are not a Christian here today, look around again. Just what makes this work? It's only because the most important thing is what we have in common. We have redeemed by Jesus. We have first come to Jesus, and in that we've met each other. Unity goes wrong when we try to meet each other and then work out whether Jesus is in it or not. If you come to Jesus, unity works itself out. So a few tips as I come towards an end. If you're a Christian, I think there are two key ways you need to ask yourself. I need to ask myself. One is proactive and the other reactive. So proactively... How can I make an effort to deliberately foster unity? And if you're a member of the church, this is a question you should be asking because you own the culture of the church of it. So the first way you can make an effort to maintain unity is be approachable so that when there is an issue, someone can actually come and talk to you about it. So are you approachable when someone comes to talk to you? Do you take responsibility to reach out? Who and how am I deliberately building community with? So it's not just avoiding the problems or dealing with the problems. It's saying, I'm going to reach out. So I want to encourage you. Chat to someone who looks entirely different to you, who's probably in a very different life phase and does things very differently after church. And why not even plan to have a coffee with them? It might be weirdly awkward the first time or the second time. But there'll be some, I, 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 believe, I think that's really, that's something unique about the church. If you're young, Find someone who is older. If you're older, find someone who's younger. Invite them for coffee or whatever it might be. And don't fear rejection. That's often why we don't reach out, isn't it? Why would they want to hang out with me? Mix cultures, mix backgrounds. So this thing of praying in languages, it's not just something nice we do. It's because we're looking forward to a time when there's this multi, mixed but unified thing that we do. And in terms of a reactive, responsive thing, with whom do I need to pursue unity? Who have I got a with? And who's got something with me that I need to take action on, whether I'm in the wrong or not? And I'll just say, take some wisdom. Don't just go and make a crazy decision because sometimes it's unhelpful. Seek wise counsel. Get people around you in the church to pray with you. Think, what is the best way? Should I be or do I just have an oversensitive conscience and I'm going to cause more trouble than there is actually? And is it just me that I'm offended and there's not really an issue here? Get counsel. Help someone speak into your life through that. Okay, because sometimes we can feel really awkward and it's as if there's a problem and there really isn't and we're just taking offense and we just need to deal with ourselves. Where am I holding on to my right more than what makes for God's glory. And as God, by His grace, raises the profile of Redeemer and gathers people to us, my prayer is that we would grow more and more united as we grow more and more diverse. I love the diversity in the room of age, of backgrounds, of what people do in their jobs and in their life, of color. It's a beautiful thing. And it's because Jesus is at the center, I trust. Because some people really like the music different, believe me. And some people would really like us to do more food. And some people, you know, think an hour and a half is a crazy length service. Mm. You know, and others want like four or five hours of service. And others think, why are we not in each other's homes all day Sunday? And, you know, it, it's just, it's good Jesus brings us together, not those things. Some of those things are, are brilliant, wonderful. That's not really good or bad, it's not the issue. Jesus brings us together. Let's keep making Jesus central. And I just finished with these verses. 
It says, be on guard. So this is Paul speaking in Acts to some leaders of the church. He says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. We are a blood-bought people. So when we come together on a Sunday, the stakes are, in one sense, wonderfully high and glorious. Jesus has bought us, brothers and sisters, with his blood. Not to attend a meeting, not to go to an event, not to appease your conscience by going to church, but to bring it into one new man that declares to the watching cosmos, God is wise. So what we're going to do is we're going to come back to worship in a moment, but we're going to do, have communion first. So hopefully you had a little communion cup. I don't have one. I wonder if someone could get me one, please. If you don't have one, put your hand up. Okay, I'm getting the impression we don't have our communion cups. We're going to get them in a little bit. Um, what you will want to do, this is the seamless bit that breaks the, the atmosphere. You want to just fold the little tag at the top and then peel off the plastic in a little bit. And once, we, once we've done that, I'll just get us to pause for a moment. Just keep your hand in the air if you need a communion cup. Thank you guys for serving us so well, Esteban and Wesley. Really appreciate it. <laughs> That's right, Dawn. Keep that hand up. <laughs> Put two up if it's for the person next to you as well, Dawn. <laughs> Wonderful. So we get communion really speaks into this, doesn't it? Communion speaks of how... Jesus on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Um, he's talking on a big scale, but the people who were most brutally treating him, he extended his forgiveness to Peter who betrayed him. And it speaks of his sacrifice. So I just want you to invite the Holy Spirit just to put people on our hearts who we, who we need to take some action with, Okay. And seek wisdom. So, Holy Spirit, we just welcome you here. We, we are jealous, Lord, for the unity of our church. Because we're jealous for your glory. We don't want to be big and disunited. We're not looking to just be small and unite. We're looking to glorify Jesus, whatever that looks like. So Lord, as we remember your body hanging on the cross, your blood shed for us, and your words that we are to love as you have loved us, we remember that we were once outside. If you're not a Christian, the things I'm going to say describe what it is to be a Christian, and you can just in your heart now say, Jesus, I want that. We remember that we were dead, Lord, objects of wrath. And you took initiative and you came to us and you have brought us near. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, just to press on our hearts who we might pursue unity with. We lay down our rights. We seek to honor you, Jesus. And we say like Peter did, yes, Lord, without reserve, because you have won us. So Lord, as we have this wafer, we remember you, your sacrifice, your pursuit of us, your mercy, your patience, your gentleness, your kindness. We remember the costs that we will never have to pay that you paid. And we say we honor you, Lord, now in our hearts by saying, yes, we will take a step. Let's take the way for when you're ready. Some of us, it's just, it's been a reminder of how we've hurt people in the past. It's true, isn't it? We, we're both perpetrators and victims when it comes to the need for reconciliation. But the blood of Jesus speaks a better word over your life than guilt and shame. So some of you, 
in these moments will be free from carrying things over the years. You've missed the opportunity to reconcile. You can't, you just can't do that anymore because that person's gone or they've shut the door and you, you're desperate to say sorry, but you just can't. Listen, Jesus' forgiveness is full and without reserve. As far as it is up to you, we're told to live at peace. You've done it all. Take his yoke, it's easy. His blood speaks of his mercy, his kindness, and his forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, that we have been brought near to you. And we have been washed white as snow. We remember your bloodshed to make it so. Let's just be still for a moment. Just um, allow the Holy Spirit to come in. Just take some action as we sit. Just ask the Lord for help. Forgive people even as we speak.